thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, before we do anything, I am going to I'd like to say acknowledgement country. So I'd like to um, just acknowledge that we're here on the, the, the land of the Darawal people and the traditional custodians of the land. And um, you can see I'm looking at my phone. I've not done this before. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. And um, I extend that respect to the Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders here today. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Dave Elkin. I'm the co-CEO here at Easy Agile. Um, we're a little business in Wollongong. Been here for about seven years. Um, and when we first moved to Wollongong, Nick and I, who's my co-founder over there, um, we started this thing called Siligong. It's a, it's a play on words from Siligong Valley. Um, we just moved back from San Francisco. And so traditionally, until this time, we've had presentations which have been mostly around coding, marketing, data, the like. But I think this is a really cool topic to discuss as a community. And um, I really wanted to just have a conversation and help inform other people around me and, and just meet like-minded people. So here we are today to have a, pre have a bit of a dive into what net zero is. And so in the capacity of just me right now, all I want to do is share what Siligong net zero is and what we want to do. Um, and so with that, if I can click the right button, I just want to take some time to talk through it. So I just want to acknowledge that we're in an energy transition and this is an exciting time. Um, yeah, we all acknowledge that burning coal and rock, like essentially burning rocks is a kind of silly idea um, and it's bad. And, and what we're heading towards is a, a greener future where we can have energy without compromising our ability to survive on planet Earth. Um, but it's an energy transition. It's not just electricity. Electricity makes up a, part, a large part of the solution. However, the big problem isn't just transitioning our electricity. We have to transition electricity heat, fuel, and et cetera. So here I have two copies of signed by the, the man himself, the big switch. Um, thank you, Jesse, for donating this. I'm really grateful wherever you are. Um, thanks, mate. And so I have a question for you all, and you're excluded. <laughs> you, I've talked to you, and Jared, you're excluded too, because I talked to you about this too. So can anyone tell me what a pedajoule is? Okay, it's a measurement of joules. 16. No. How many zeros are there in a petajoule? Does anyone know? 15. And then the next question is how many gigawatt hours is that? Anyone going to get this one, maybe? No. I can't, I can't. 10 trillion hours. Um, maybe we'll find another question, but the answer is um, actually 278 gigawatt hours. So that's a lot of energy. Um, so here's a here's a, a I'm going to put QR codes up on the screen as well. So if you want to take a get your coma out, you can you can check the sources. Um, this is from the government. It tells you how much one petajoule is. Um, essentially, it's around nineteen thousand homes energy use per year. One petajoule. Cool. So keep that in mind because we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So Australia's energy consumption. Consumption. So we the energy we use to run the country, and this is. The date you can see there's a little drop there for COVID um, was around. I've got some numbers here. Um, eight. It was about six thousand petajoules of energy. So it's 114 million houses worth of energy to run the country. Um, so energy. That's that's not the end of it though. Um, like here we are. This is the energy, including exports of energy from Australia. So. Household use of energy in uh, 2021 was 1,215 petajoules of energy. Um, you add on industry, that's 2,676 petajoules of energy. And we exported 18,338 petajoules of energy in various forms, which is around 348,422,000 houses of Australian houses of energy use per year. So that's a lot. Of, that's, I think that's a lot of houses, right? Um, so what we're talking about here is a big, 
big issue. This is all mostly carbon-based energy sources that we need to abate, replace with alternatives. So this is the challenge in front of us. And um, oh, yeah, a little bit more on the domestic and energy exports. So giving a bit of perspective, and I apologize if I'm getting too fast, I'm getting really excited. Um, you can see here a chart, and once again, the data is here if you want to scan that and see it for yourself, um, of our use of the energy that we produce and the one that, that we export. So black coal here is the standout. We export a lot of black coal, which is going around the world to do work. And at the same time, compromise our ability to live as a human race on the or species on the earth and other species as well, I might add. So, and you can see over there, solar, wind and hydro. We don't export any of that at the moment. Um, it'd be cool. I know there's someone in the world who's kind of trying to consider doing that. Um, but yeah, this is what we're talking about. This is the kind of breadth of the things, the topics I want to bring to Silicon um, Net Zero. Um, and I want to get other experts in who can talk about these topics as well as electrification, which we'll get to. So yeah, that's that's pretty much a rundown of what I'd love, the breadth of what I'd love to talk about. I know it sounds like a big problem, but um, I also like to talk about what we can do as a community around this topic. So the first one and is to stay informed. So become one with the information around you. Um, meditate on net zero, understand all the information you can. So keep an open mind. Here's some great ways to do that. I love listening to these two podcasts. I'm pretty biased. I love the Renew Economy website and the podcast that Giles puts out. These are great. Energy Insiders is about how we can learn about the energy systems behind the scenes and the, the markets that pl at play there. Um, and Switched On is more from a household perspective. Um, so you can understand how you can have electrify effectively yourself and new technologies coming out. A book, once again. All right, can I task you with asking a question later? Sure. All right, we'll this one out. Thanks, mate. Um, I have there are other books as well. I can only quote this one because I haven't read other books. Um, but this is the this is the we are so lucky to have um Sol as a local. We we could have invited him tonight, I guess, but I just didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I forgot about it. Um, and he's probably busy doing something bigger and more more exciting somewhere else. But great book, highly recommended. It's got a lot of practical stuff in there about how we can better electrify and why and, and all those reasons. So please take a chance to, to buy a copy and read it. Um, the number two thing that we can do is get excited. I am excited by this. Yeah, it's a huge challenge, but there's so many cool things that come about when we're challenged as a human race. Now, I don't like talking about World War II. It was a terrible thing, but as a result, we've got lots of great technologies. Um, we can apply the same mindset to trying to attack um, carbon and find alternatives that we can we can use instead. So some of the things I'm excited about, um, Raygen, these, these guys are building salt, it's not solar thermal, it's concentrated PV. And they take the heat and they put it into water and they use some of the energy to make the other water cold and they can, based on 90 degrees and zero degree of water, they can make more electricity from that. So with 17 hours of storage, blows my mind. This is amazing. I'm I'm super excited by Quay's energy. <laughs> this is just such a pipe dream. They they take it, they take a gyros gyrotron out of a fusion reactor and point it at the ground and dig a huge hole, like 50 kilometers deep. That's the plan anyway. I haven't done it yet. And then you can essentially turn the end the they take the heat energy out of the, the uh, earth. And they say that if they took 1% of the energy available in the crust or in the mantle would power humanity at its current energy rate for like 100 million years, something like that. So there's, yeah. Rhonda, much smaller scale, but these guys are building refractory bricks, which is a known technology. But instead of heating them up with, because that's a way to capture heat from industrial processes and reuse it later. Instead of capturing heat from industrial processes, they'll heat it up with electricity from renewable sources. And then they'll use that heat later to run turbines. Super cool, such a simple solution. Super excited. Super excited about Janus. Janus, they make big trucks. They convert, well, they don't make the trucks, they convert the trucks to electric. Or like a local company. They also have, a, the, the owner is actually, the, uh, owns a, um, a diesel uh, distribution company. Well, he did, and his, his daughter said, I hate your business, you're killing the world. He's like, okay, I'll fix that. 
And now he's going to have charging stations every 500 kilometers down the highway, which will have huge batteries in them, 500 kilowatt hours each, um, which are essentially stationary storage. So he can play in the market of the electricity market and then charge them. So it's essentially a one-way battery. He charges from the grid, puts them in a truck. The truck goes down to Melbourne, they plug in, they charge it again. So it's the only stationary storage that's only ever charging. It can charge forever, doesn't discharge. Like every other battery has to discharge at some point because it can't keep taking more energy. Super excited. Um, and of course, Sun Cable. So Mike Cannonbrooks, my former boss, is trying to build that. This is just a render. Um, the biggest solar system in the world to, to pipe direct energy to Singapore. Um, and that's essentially what we're talking about at the beginning there, exporting lots of petajoules of energy. We need to do that. But instead of using carbon-based things, we want to we ship direct electrons and other derivative products of solar and wind. So just a quick one, and this is like a kind of a, I don't know how I can say it politely, but it's amazing what you can, what you find when you look. And sometimes we need to be forced to look and some people don't want to look, they want to stay the same. But I don't believe in that mentality. I think, yep, let's open our eyes, let's look and we'll be amazed at what we can find. The new future is ahead of us, which is going to be really expect, um, spectacular, quite honestly. And so the third thing we can do is electrify all the things. Um, We're going to have some presentations tonight to help through that. I was going to run through my experience at this point, but I've taken too much of a time already. Um, and so with that, I'd, I'd like to just talk quickly about who we're going to hear from tonight. So Tim, Tim Savage is here. He's actually an architect colleague of mine. We worked at Fairfax together a long time ago, and now we're here again. Um, and Tim worked on a company which was about modeling energy efficiency. So the energy we do use, is far better. Like our houses are essentially tents in Australia. Um, it's good to be able to use the energy we put into them more effectively. Um, and then we're also hearing from Ty. So Ty, fantastic electrical engineer, with a huge... <laughs> and so Ty had um, cut his teeth in the, um, the distribution industry with... Um, what was Endeavor called before Endeavor was called Endeavor? Oh, we can, how far do you want to go back? Yeah. I'll, I'll give myself my own intro to start with yep. the upper Jurassic period. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it for me. Um, and with that, I would like to hand over to to, to to Tim, if I may. Let me just go and get it up. Okay. Okay. It's a hot topic. Where are we? There we are. Point. Hang on. That can go away. And this can share. I think you just press right to go next. Oh. All right. So um, I was going to do a quick talk about a project I started with um, with a business partner about it was over a decade ago. Um, we've sort of been working on this old enough over a long period of time. And essentially what it was all about was doing energy audits on people's houses and then uh, finding ways of doing it much simpler. And it got, well, actually it's more than just houses, it's also on the business. It was later on once we got, once we got it all started and we started that other people wanted to, to find out about this stuff. Um, so it's all about how do we do those audits? How do we make it simpler? How do we make it so anyone can do it? without having to be an energy auditor, which is quite a, a involved process. Now, is this going to be the next day? So what is an energy an audit? So basically, it's all about determining your building's efficiency um, and then providing ways of either reducing your energy usage or uh, which is usually type of costs for a lot of people. But you know, if, if you're into this sort of topic, then it's all about reducing your usage. Um, so we can be a bit more efficient about you know, what, what we do, it, what we use. Um, it usually involves having someone come into your house, modeling the house, determining all your appliances, age, construction, materials used in the, in the building, um, how, how much air can get in and out of your house easily, and then um, running simulations on that. So yeah, so exactly all this kind of stuff. We uh, build a model, um, 
where are you? That, that's a pretty big, important part of it as well. Obviously, if you're in a hotter part of the world, then uh, the, the maths are different. Um, we then run a base simulation of that. It's a physics based simulation where we can uh, look at all those inputs and, and come up with measurements of, of the usage and uh, what we estimate the usage to be. Um, we do all that with a, a piece of software called Energy Plus. And Energy Plus is an open source piece of software. Um, it's developed by the US Department of Energy. Um, anyone can go and get it, but I don't know if anyone's actually tried to configure it. Um, that's where it's almost like a whole programming language in itself, and it's just incredibly complex. There's lots of inputs that you're going to need, and most people don't have that scratch your head. I don't even know how to ask it works myself. Um, my business partner actually does all of that stuff. <laughs> He's got the PhD in that stuff, so I'll let him work all that out. But essentially, we, we model your house, we put it all on there, we run a baseline simulation, and then we start optimizing certain things. So a good example of that is you have PV. Don't we'll put PV on and run the simulation again. Now, in our particular case, we have 20 different scenarios. Um, that's everything from uh, do you have insulation in the house or not? Um, if we can improve the um, the envelope of the house, so you don't need to heat up as easily. Um, what's another one? One of the simpler ones is just change the shower head. And, uh, turning your shower head is a pretty good one. It has a big impact. You need a lot less heat um, by doing that. Um, but again, this is all very difficult. So the, the problem we tried to solve was how do we make this much simpler so that anybody can do it? So how we sort of ended up doing this is that we build a build a, a an application. At the moment, it's a minimum of about five questions. We can give you a rough estimate of what your house would be. Um, there is actually about three or four hundred questions if you want to go right down into the weeds, um, and and to, to sort of get that. So I guess the basic questions we probably ask is. What's your address is actually our number one question now. Um, there's a lot of great data sets out there. And we thought we could dig into those. We can get the footprint of your house from an online service. Um, and then tell us what kind of roof you've got, if you've got PV, if you have a pool, all of these kind of things will be into our simulations. Um, then we'll get information about how often you're there. That actually has a pretty big impact on it. How often are people in the house? Um, the other thing we do is we provide defaults. So we try to default as much as we can based off a few of those basic five questions. So um, the age of your house, that tells us a lot. Age of your appliances, we can sort of get some estimates of what the average appliance will use. Um, we have large databases of every appliance sold in Australia um, up to about, it's about 2010, I think our database goes to at this point in time. And from that, we can pull out coefficients of performance and all this kind of stuff. Again, most people struggle with it. Once we do that, we do we run with multiple simulations. We look at the results, and if there's a significant improvement in the energy performance of your house from a simulation, that's when you can start providing recommendations. So obviously, that shared one is a, is a pretty good one. Um, the number one recommendation for everyone is insulation. That is by far the cheapest thing you can do. It will pay for itself within a year often. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically the platform. If we're currently at, the, at this point in time kind of putting the thing on ice. COVID kind of knocked us off. And um, we're not really running it at this point in time, although I can bring uh, parts of the platform back up. Uh, hopefully in the, in the next few months, we are going to bring it back to life again um, once we can get the costs of running it down because running large simulation uh, EC2 instances is not cheap. Um, that's that's some of the details about it. Um, does anyone have any questions you want to ask about it, then feel free. Um, going into the simulation itself, I'm going to try and get my business partner to come along um, and just talk about a bit more detail about simulations. He's been doing some on this. He has been that. Not quite sure what what he was talking about yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, that's it. Thanks. Yeah, cool.
So you provide this uh, either for free or for a fee. Yeah, free. Uh, well, okay, one house. Yeah. Uh, what as a house owner? Yeah. Uh, what do I do then? Okay, so that's where at the end the recommendations would be. Here's all the things you can do to reduce your energy yeah. consumption, and it will give you a list of um, all the different sort of things you can do based on cost and payback period. We were trying to look at eventually hooking us up to having supplier so you can supply those. Yeah, and that sort of scenario. But, but yeah, it's basically that. Two questions here. <laughs> so I know we talked a bit about some of the drive over. If we wanted to do this now, are we too late because you shut it down? Or um, can you I can, I can bring that back up for you. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I think now you might get. I know. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually had a major energy company using this because for a while they were mandated that they had to help people who were struggling to reduce the energy cost. Um, and we actually filled that gap. Um, but then, of course, COVID hit and that all disappeared. So it's funding. Yeah, two. I was, yeah, actually, I can see him. I'm just curious about the shower head thing. What else seems to know about this? <laughs> yeah, and efficient shower here will reduce okay. the proof of the water. So, yeah. Shower house cooling house. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Sorry. 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 Recommendations. Um, yeah, so solar was actually probably one of our lower recommendations because of the cost. Um, there's a lot of things you can do before you get solar to reduce your energy cost. You know, obviously, with the spill prices going up right now, that may change a bit. Yeah, but yeah, like like I said, insulation. I did the numbers when we were living in rentals. If we if you go to rental for a year, I worked out it's actually cheaper to put insulation in yourself. And pay for the power cost. So, yeah, wants to charge it to go. Yeah, not that expensive. But then, yeah. Okay, well, my other question is um, if the cost of running your business is, you know, prohibitive or has been prohibitive, mm -hmm. why not charge for it? Um, we have considered that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we did, it was along the lines of we were trying to get numbers in first. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get a marketplace of, of um, you know, businesses offering services that you haven't got buyers looking at it. So, yeah, using business problems. And we're not business people. So, <laughs> uh, business I've, got, I've got one question. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a property developer by any means, uh, but would it make sense to be using simulations like that at the development of property? So, like large apartment buildings? Like okay, yeah. So, that platform is used by architects, etc., to do simulations of, um, of that kind of stuff. Um, probably going to have to main with it target. We actually been asked to domain at one point. Um, I know there has been talk of regulations coming in to when you sell your property, you have to get an efficiency rating. Um, and that's kind of what we're waiting for. <laughs> if that turns up, then suddenly it'll be alive again. <laughs> Your problem with property developers is they won't do it. Yeah, they'll just build the grade. Yeah, it's not a problem with any buildings in the world. And then we will build my house. I also know that I I rented a house in Wollongong, and um, the the coldness from the floor. Is it like you can insulate underneath the floor as well, right? So, Ty, do you, do you mind if I use? Do you want to just use this computer? I've got your presentation right here. Cool. Um, Always be easy. Can I present? How do you present this thing? Where's the present button? Slideshow. You can hit down in the bottom. Is it? Is it? 
Oh, maybe I've got glasses. Where's the button? Yeah, I usually use around the bottom. I can't see. I haven't got the glasses. Oh, can we move that up? Yeah, oh, you can. Can we see down there? That one there? I think that's it. It's not available. It's not available. It's not available. So we'll Is that the PDF that you've got there? No, or it's not the, the, I've got the PDF. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. I'll get the PDF. Oh, you no, know, it's okay. You know, just, I'll get my computer. Yeah, sure. How do we do that? Ready, just look up your Wi-Fi? Yeah. Just let me... Yeah. If, you, if you, um... I think it's brought the PDF, that's easiest. Yeah, I've got it right here. PDF, if that's it, easy. If, if that's not changed... Yeah, okay. So, no, okay, no, it's we'll, 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 the same pressure either way. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's dumb. It's got no animation or any crap like that. Good. So, just do that much. So, easy. <laughs> Okay, and just down arrows, go on there. Okay. Before we all degenerate into a rabble again, get everyone. My name's Ty. Um, I feel like this is an AA meeting for a second. Hi, hi, I'm Ty, and I'm an electrical engineer. Um, but yes, as Dave was saying, I'm an electrical engineer. I started in the electricity supply industry in, yes, 1986. No, you can't be that old. I hear them all cry. Yes, I am. Um, straight from, sorry? The first picture, 1987. Yes. Thanks, Pam. Anyway, so I started out with Illawarra County Council in the electricity supply industry. Um, I trained as an electrical fitter mechanic, overhead lines person. I'll use the correct term now, or line worker, and um, as an electrical engineer. Uh, my career then spanned the subsequent 34 years in the electricity supply industry. Um, Illawarra County Council became Illawarra Electricity, Illawarra Electricity when it was corporatized, that then became um, Integral Energy. And it was that for many, many years. Then the retail function, which we'll get to in the exciting slides that follow, the retail function was hived off from Integral Energy and it became Endeavour Energy, which was where I ended my career within the industry. Um, I was 10 years on the executive of the company, the last five of which as, although it was never my title, was the chief engineer. So that's not the big note, that's just to give you a flavor as to why I'm such an energy industry geek. And that's probably the main, <laughs> the main reason to set that up. Um, I retired out of the electricity industry um, I discovered I was really bad at being retired. So I then saw an opportunity that came up with the University of Wollongong. So I now work at the University of Wollongong in energy futures research, helping to herd the cats in the university environment. And now is no work, mate. Hey, there it is. Okay. So. Dave did a really good introduction in terms of the size and scope of what we're facing here. And yes, the energy transformation is far more than electricity. I get asked a lot when people find out what, what I do for a living. What's the answer, Todd? What's the silver bullet? Is it hydrogen? Is it nuclear? Is it offshore wind? Is it onshore wind? Is it solar on home? Is it big solar outlets? Is it magic energy crystals falling from the sky? What about pumped hydro? And the answer is that this is a multiple choice exam B, all of the above. The answer is there is no silver bullet. The answer is there is a silver buckshot. What we need to do is play each technology, each solution and each action from each of us, where it's going to give the maximum leverage and maximum benefits. No one thing is going to solve all of this with the utmost respect to your former boss, Mr. Cameron Brooks. <laughs> so the traditional, in order to understand this, I'll try and keep this as entertaining as possible. But the content that we're about to go through is as dry as the camel's dry bits in many ways in terms of explaining how the electricity system that gets 
keeps these lights on actually works, but it's important as a foundational piece than seeing the pathway for how it can change. So the traditional electricity grid is best described as being one way. It was designed originally around the technology that was available, and that was a small number of mostly coal-fired power stations. You count it virtually on your fingers. Flowing power one way, downhill from where it was generated in these coal-fired power stations to all of our homes. All of the rules, all of the regulations, all of the market structures, all of the, not just the foundations, the hole in the ground that they dug to pour the foundations of the electricity industry is based on this model right here. And the only thing wrong with that is that there's no relationship to the electricity grid that's supplying our electricity right now. And that's one of the major challenges that we face here. It's actually not technology in the electricity industry. The first priorities and the first challenges we face in reform in all of this are actually regulations and market reform. The tech to move the needle massively from where it is now already exists. And the places to take action already exist as well. Now, the biggest transformation that's occurred in our energy supply system, in memory, since forever, has occurred through the actions not of any of the major incumbent players. It hasn't occurred through the actions of the distributors, my alma mater, the DNSPs, you'll, you'll get all the acronyms in the world in a moment. There'll be a test later. I'll give you a <laughs> No. It hasn't occurred through the actions of the big generators. It certainly hasn't occurred through the actions of the cartels, which are the gem tailors, AGL, Origin Energy, and um, Energy Australia, who are manipulating the market to their own bottom line. And, and good upon them. The rules in the market let them do that. That's, that's the, the multi-billion dollar companies that are there to make multi-billion dollars, and that's what they're dang well doing in a market that lets them do it. But the biggest change that's occurred in our energy supply has been done by us. And it's been done by people putting solar on their homes. And as a result of that, distributed energy resource has been created and more and more batteries coming into homes, solar on businesses, smaller scale renewables coming into the grid. We end up with a grid that looks very different now than it has in the past. Energy is not flowing two ways. Energy is flowing up, down, sideways, whatever, whatever. And what that means is we're seeing, and again, sorry for the blurriness, there'll be no test on that one later. I'll run through a little bit on the, on the left side here. But the key message here is, and the bit that bends most people's minds, and certainly did mine as an electrical engineer for many years, is there has always been a separation between the physics of how we get our electricity and how we get our energy and the financials and economics of how the markets are structured. They are actually different. And when you start trying to understand the markets and how they work, based on how energy actually flows, um, you'll probably find yourself having to take Prozac or something. <laughs> because the two are completely divorced from each other. And what, what's happened over time is the gap between the two has become more and more as we find ourselves now in this completely different energy environment. So how the market's been structured has been to have generators and retailers that operate in markets and the separation between the market and the monopoly and monopoly functions, which are the so-called poles and wires that you hear everyone talk about. The, thing that you're never going to duplicate sensibly, and that's the physical energy grid that transports energy. It used to be from generators to homes. Now it's just between homes and, and all around. So there's this fundamental concept of there being stuff that can be a market and other stuff that can be a monopoly. And the markets are left to have a light-handed touch, some rules are set around it and off they go. And that's where you get the sort of behavior that I was um, disparaging major companies um, about just a moment ago. And then of course, you've got the monopolies and they're regulated so that they're meant to try and operate as efficiently as possible. Sitting over all of these is the hidden industry that most people don't even know about. The A-team, as I like to call them, dripping with sarcasm, as I say that. The A-team are the regulators. They are national bodies, three of them all together. They are, in no particular order, the Australian Energy Regulator, the AER, the Australian Energy Market Operator, AEMO, and the Australian Energy Market Commission, 
for the A and the MC. So these are three of them that operate in a, what they call a triangular structure. Now in engineering, the triangular structure is the strongest structure that you can have. In politics, it's the weakest. And the reality is there are, there are political entities, most of them. So what happens here is these regulators, one of them, the AEMC, sets the rules. Here are the rules that everyone must follow. The AER sets the economic boundaries and, and, and regulates the monopoly businesses. Here's how much they can earn. Here's how much the markets can um, trade, what they can trade in, et cetera, et cetera. And AEMO, if you hear that, is the um, supposedly the once removed system planner. They're there to make sure the technical aspects actually work and to balance the market and technical areas so that the lights stay on, to put it that sort of bluntly. The problem with that triangle is most of the action that's occurring now is either occurring in the middle of the triangle, and they're all looking away from it, the outside, or is occurring well outside their sphere of influence and the rules and regulations that are there now. So without just kind of going on with generalities, I'll give you some facts and figures to sort of back that up. Lots of talk just recently. I didn't realize how popular this thing when I put the slides together. Arari, everyone's talking about Arari. Biggest coal-fired power station in Australia, 2.8 or 2.9 gigawatts. 2.8 and change, depending whether you round up or round down. That's all well and good. The combined capacity of all of the big solar farms, you know, the paddocks covered in solar panels and that sorts of thing in the national electricity market at the moment, 10 gigawatts. The combined capacity of solar on the roofs of our homes and businesses is 20 gigawatts at the moment. It's actually more than that. That 20 gigawatts is the end of 2022 verified number. We are connecting three gigawatts of solar to the roofs of our homes each and every year. We're connecting an Arari to the roofs of our homes each and every year. And that means most days, I'll show you some curves in a moment, we're running the electricity through backwards, frontwards, sidewards. <laughs> um, and the result of that is all of the rules are basically backwards as well, as I was saying earlier. So one of the things that we see in all this, and I'm shamelessly stealing from the, um, these ones are from the Rewiring Australia website as well, that is um, part of Saul's gro Saul Griffith's book. Yes, I'm a bit of a fanboy. <laughs> um, basically, the benefits of solar on your homes, and I appreciate not everyone can afford a roof and obviously respect that and understand that. But for those that can, the marginal costs of solar compared to grid scale electricity prices in the in the Australian market at the moment. And these are old now, because this is showing around 30 cents a kilowatt hour. It's actually up around 38 now is the, the current going rate per kilowatt hour that we pay. It's three cents long run. And that includes if you finance the solar panels on your home, et cetera, et cetera. It's a tenth, less than a tenth now of the cost of solar, of the cost of grid energy, regardless of the source that it comes from. One of the reasons for that is because the entire market structures that we have at the moment are built around charging to transport power from a small number of big generators through all of the grid down to us as end users. That's the whole way the market is set up. Whereas the bulk of the energy that's coming into the market is actually happening at number four speed, going out, up the spout, across, this is electrically, and into number six, Smith Street. Electrically, that's what's happening. Financially, <laughs> not so much. Financially, the next door neighbor is still paying the 38 cents a kilowatt hour to buy from the main grid. But what this also means is of the, and to reference it here, sorry, there's lots of numbers here, but just trying to give you the scale of them. Of the 30 cents that was in the previous slide, 10 cents of that per kilowatt hour on average um, is the grid charges. That's what you pay to wheel the power through the transmission network and through the distribution network to get it to your home on the assumption that it's coming from some remote area. So what this means is, and I, I, I just love this when I've seen it on the Rewiring Australia sites, that's why I put it up here and full credit to them again, full accreditation down the bottom, not my work, it's just brilliant. 
even if there was a magic generator, and this is this is the case, by the way, I'm not anti or pro nuclear, I'm a scientist and engineer. I kind of really like nuclear, if the truth be known. I hope you get out of the room alive here <laughs> as a as a technology. But the bottom line of it is um, too expensive and too late is is the bottom line for it in the energy grid of Australia, given the march of renewables where they sit at the moment. So, but what this means is let's say you could generate with a magic generator, electricity for free, cost zero cents. Under the current market rules, you then transport that to all of our homes, and it's going to cost you 10 cents a kilowatt hour, as opposed to generating on your roof for three. That's the, that's the business case for decarbonizing your life and electrifying the domestic part of our lives. Now, the flip side of this, if I just jump into the next one, is this. Solar is really, really, really good until the sun goes down, then not so much. You've got to be able to store it. We'll get a little bit more into that in a moment. But the other reality is that the part of the grid that all of this solar on the roofs of our homes is connected to is called the low voltage grid. It's the 230 volts or that you're here, it's what's coming out of the power point over there in terms of the, the part of the grid. There's no better way to describe this, I've found, than to say that the low voltage part of the electricity grid is best characterized as being the unloved redheaded stepchild of the energy network. It's okay, my sister's a ranger, so I can get away with it. Okay. <laughs> so is my granddad. But with full love, with full love to Rangers, it's just a way to describe that it's a part of the grid that's been basically set and forget and completely neglected. And yet it's now a part of the grid that's playing probably the most critical function of any other part of the energy grid that we've seen. And so what that means is we are not going to ever be able to supply the Wollongong CBD that we're in at the moment, or the steelworks or the Sydney CBD, or the Tomago aluminium smelter, biggest electrical load in the country, from rooftop solar. Never going to happen. Because physics. Because the wires that are connecting all of that lovely 20, now probably close to 23 gigawatts of electricity on all of, it, all of our homes is connected by wires that are that big or smaller out into the street. And the physics mean you cannot ship that amount of energy upstream, across, and then downstream to the big energy users. That sounds like a problem. It's not. It's actually an opportunity. What that means is we need to be using that energy right where it's actually created. This is where electrifying our homes, electrifying our suburbs, putting in place distributed community batteries, three batteries in the suburbs, to soak, soak up all of that lovely solar when there's, frankly, more of it than the grid can cope with during the middle of the day. And then as soon as the sun goes down, let's, all, let's have it all back overnight. Thank you very much for coming. The opportunity here, and um, in this book, it's, it's enunciated quite well. It's actually explained even better in the quarterly essay that Saul put out in um, March of this year where he talks about, um, he doesn't use these terms, but I would use it. This is, for me, the opportunity of small grid versus big grid thinking. We need to embrace small grid, and this is where we can take action, because we already have with all the solar that we put on our homes. We can take entire suburbs to what I would call grid light. It means they're not disconnected from the grid and operating autonomously. You'd have to put too much storage in to do that. Um, storage is great if you're taking a duration period of getting you through the night until the sun comes up in the morning. The economics start looking very, very shaky. And indeed, so does the carbon footprint of the battery production starts looking very, very shaky if you start saying we need enough storage to get through two weeks of rain. That's, that's the difference. But if you could get suburbs to the point where they present very little demand infrequently into the main grid, then a lot of the other problems that people talk about, about building big transmission lines and connecting wind inland, large solar farms inland, offshore wind even, all of those things. I'm not anti any of them, trust me. We need all of that with the dial turned up to 11 as well. 
but the amount of it that we're going to need could be reduced by probably one third by us going to an energy autonomous in our suburbs and in our homes approach for running the grid and running things very differently than they have before. Just mindful of time and want to leave lots of time for questions if that's all right. Is that okay? Yeah, we're good. Time yeah. check. Okay, yeah. good. Um, this is just a snapshot when I put the slides together. This is an open NEM if you if you want to geek out on this stuff. The open NEM, it's all available there. That's um, on the day that I took this. For a 24 hour period, that shows you of the electricity demand that needed to be served, where did it come from during those various parts of the day? The colors are, are actually quite descriptive as well. The brown is brown coal, which you talk about burning rocks, that's actually burning mud. <laughs> brown coal, it's, it's, it's horrendous as a technology. Guess what the black one is? That'd be burning coal. Um, we then go through the others, gas. You see the sort of some of the peaking plant coming in here. This is the evening period. I couldn't, when I took the snapshot putting it together, I couldn't get it so that this was morning or whatever. So this is actually 5 p.m. here. And then the two big yellow ones, it's hard to tell, there's actually two different shades of yellow. The bottom one they call solar utility. That's the big solar farms out west. And the top one is solar rooftop. That's all of our solar and that sort of thing on our homes. And so what this shows is, when the sun's up, we're supplying 40% of our energy free from the sun, or notwithstanding the capital cost to put the assets in, but in terms of the actual marginal cost of production, virtually free from the sun. Challenge is as soon as the sun goes down, then you've got to have enough storage, or that's when you see, in particular, the batteries and battery discharge, the big blue, the blue one there, hydro, the darker blue, and um, in particular, gas peaking plant come in. Um, because I've got the opportunity and I never miss a chance to sink the slipper if I can, um, here's an interesting fact. I won't name the company because that would be naughty of me, but one of the three big gen tailors, you, you hear the, the name gen tailor, they were both a generator and a retailer, who supplies one of the big three cartels, um, whose portfolio of generation it has historically been largely comprised of gas gas peaking plant and that sort of thing. You'll guess which one, because the name's kind of in their title. <laughs> um, have historically, and still to this day, wait and withhold their gas into the market, into the national electricity market, their gas generation, until such time as the prices are going through the roof. And they hold back and hold back, and when the prices are at sufficiently extortive levels, they bid their generation into the market and they make that rate back for their gas-fired generation. Now, that company is making a big song and dance about how they're greening their portfolio. Less cotton socks on that one. Um, and one of the first initiatives that they've done is they've purchased a very large grid-connected battery, which is great. I've been on Open NEM and had a look at the bidding characteristics of that big battery through the winter that we've just had because electricity demand and energy demand peaks in winter and summer, heating and cool, obviously. That battery, here, I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll give you a choice. I won't give away the book for this one. That'll come in a moment, but here's the choice. Do you think they sit there, wait till the sun's gone down and go, well, the best thing we can do for all of our customers and everyone in energy prices now is discharge that battery right now and lock that peak down and, and that sort of thing? Or do you think they just treat it like it's a gas fire generator and withhold that battery from the market until prices re reach a sufficiently extortive level in the wholesale market and then bid the battery in and make the same price from the battery as they do from their gas fire generation? I'll give you three guesses as to which one of those two they're doing right now. What's, what is that evidence of? That they're bad and evil? No. No, that's evidence of them behaving in a reasonable way that the rules allow them to behave. What that is evidence of is the rules are totally effed up. So second last one, here's the duck curve when people start talking about the duck. And it's another way to express what I was talking about earlier. And uh, this is again where we're seeing more and more challenges in the, uh, in the um, electricity supply dynamic. And that is because more and more during the day, 
we see an absence of demand because we're running on our own solar. And then as soon as the sun goes down, we're seeing demand go zhushed up, straight up there. And that's when you hear people talking about a duck curve. I thought you didn't want to be condescending or mansplain to the audience, but that's what the duck curve actually is. I put a duck on it because I figured that would explain it. And what it means is more and more solar during the day is going to make grid stability, uh, not enough demand to use the energy that's being created, more and more of an issue. Bottom line is we're going to be wasting that solar unless we do something with it. The best thing we can do, start storing it and start using it locally. Solution again, more storage and more local. Now, before I do, before I launch into a bit on home electrification, last two slides, so you'll be glad to know. Um, show of hands and I'll just pick someone at random. What's the largest energy using appliance or function in Australian homes on average, not counting if you've got an EV and an EV charger. Let's just uh, say there. Shower head. <laughs> <laughs> well, who have we got? Who have we got? Okay, you sir. Yeah. Nope. Is that? Close, but no cigar. That not used often enough. When it's being used, yes, but not used often enough. I'll be back there. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Okay, Tam. Okay, I'm yeah. Yes! Yes! <laughs> And that, and that's why, and that's why the shower head gets you so much benefit. Yeah. Doesn't matter whether it's, and I'm talking energy here. Doesn't matter whether it's a gas. Doesn't matter whether it's electricity. Your biggest user, your biggest individual user, over time. Yes, your dryer will use a lot of electricity, but you don't usually need to use or use your dryer all the time. Same with your air conditioner, same with your heater, or whatever. What's the one that's pumping away that you churn through each and every day? It's your hot water system. You're using hot water all the time. So hot water is the major consumer. My own home, which we'll see in the next slide, Chateau Christopher in the mountains, is um, one third of my energy is hot water. Now a lot of now a lot of that's because I've got two teenagers. <laughs> But that's but that's a rant for me. That's a cloud for me to yell at at another time. So um, that's about how effective having conversation is. It is. I would just go outside and yell at the sky. Um, yeah. Oh. Oh, Tam, don't start me. I curse myself. I curse myself because the shower backs onto the hallway upstairs. I curse myself for not putting another tap sticking out into the hallway. I can walk up. Here's a screen. Thank you. Everything's done. Yeah, just a happy. Not a sadness. Much. Hey, they're mine. I can torture them. So, home electrification. First first message is you don't have to be Amish. My kids have grown up. My kids have never known anything but an all-electric home. The home that we live in now, I built 24 years ago. It's all electric. The one before it was all electric as well. It was much smaller. And if you ask my kids there, you said that they were in this, you know, sort of leading edge, all electric home and lived this all electric life or whatever, their answer would be, huh? Would not. Would not know that their life is any different. Um, where do you start? We've had terrific advice on, on that from here. Best thing you can do, and this is the biggest challenge. Building new is frankly a lot easier than retrofit. The reality of electrifying all of our lives is it is fundamentally a retrofit issue for our nation. Um, where to start? Insulate, insulate, insulate. Make the box, not the tent. Um, we, I work with the Sustainable Buildings Research Centre over at the University of Wollongong. And, you know, you have a look at the air exchange rates. It was good when COVID was on. Australian homes are really good for managing COVID because they're leaving <laughs> AF. <laughs> so the, um, not so good for thermal management. As we um, as we know when we live in them, so insulate, insulate, insulate. Um, even I mean, double glazing is probably excessive given our climate zone. But sealing around doors, I just I thought my house was pretty good. I put a new front door in because the old one aged out of existence um, earlier this year, and the new door I put in um, 
because the domestic authorities thought this was the, the premium one to get. And I, <laughs> and I never need the excuse to over, over engineer the shit out of anything. <laughs> um, uh, aluminium frame, double glaze, sort of European standard with all the, you know, sort of it's like, so the airlock on the, on the space station when you shut it. And even I was gobsmacked at the difference it's made to the energy consumption over this winter to our home, just the front door of the home. Unbelievable. So even, you know, everyone's still learning, trust me. So energy efficiency, heating and cooling. Pick one thing. Pick one thing for your heating and cooling. Reverse cycle air conditioning, especially when it's been run with modern inverter-based technology. Use it for your heating, use it for your cooling. Having two things, oh, I'm using gas heater for heating and then I'm using my air conditioner in summer. No, pick one thing and use it. That minimises your energy consumption overall and also minimises the carbon footprint of your activity. Um, I'm not lecturing in any of this. I'm just letting people know what I've done and suggesting things. People ask me, why did I do that? Um, without being too maudlin about it, I... I didn't do any of this because I was a rabid environmentalist 24 years ago or wanted to save the planet. I did it because I'm a licensed electrician and I don't have to get someone else in to do anything <laughs> in my home. Um, makes life a lot easier when you can just do it yourself. But the heating and cooling in particular was one thing. I grew up in um, through the 70s and the 80s and I can vividly remember lots of terrible stories about small children falling into kerosene heaps, falling into gas heaps. The, the little pajamas catching fire. Absolutely horrendous thing. So, you know, friends that have burnt themselves and that sort of thing is problems. So my mission was to make my house um, safe for my kids, who didn't exist when I built it, but it came along a little bit later. So for me, reverse cycle air conditioning is the way to go. Because for heating, warm air comes out of the vent in the ceiling and the little buggers can't hurt themselves. That was my logic behind it. Turns out it was actually really, really good environmentally as well. Um, is your switchboard up to the task? That's one of the most frequent questions that we get asked. And I've got a solution for that that I'll speak about in a moment. One of the biggest problems with older homes is old switchboards. You know, they're too small. They haven't got real estate. You can't fit all of the things on them to run an all-electric house from the switchboard on your home, um, as well as the fact that, you know, the incoming mains from the street, especially, you know, in a much older home will be basically a bit of you know a bit of fencing wire and um it has nowhere near the rating. So when you are looking to electrify your home, um a suggestion that I make for people is to say, look at the long term. And there may be some future proof upfront investments that you have to make that will allow you to then go on the journey as the other appliances in your home age out and you start to replace them with electric alternatives, whether it be your, your cooktop with induction heating and so forth. So it may well be that early on, you've got to invest the capital up front and do something like upgrade the consumer's mains that connect with the underground or overhead, your, your home into the street, and it may well be that you need to upgrade your switchboard up front and that will carry a cost, unfortunately. But then once done, you build in the ability to then start electrifying other appliances as they, as they age out. Um, do, I, do I need to upgrade to three phase? Mm -hmm. Am I speaking in tongues when I say three phase or am I going to mansplain if I say what three phase is? Show of hands, who understands what three phase is or not? Yeah, I love this audience. <laughs> so that's right. Single phase is what most homes have, or many homes have, um, one power wire and one neutral in your home. Three phase is three power wires. Um, obviously, you get a lot more oomph out of um, three phase. And then, of course, what are you doing with your transport? So um, here's an example, uh, as you know, as I like to call, there's Chateau Christopher in the mountains. Um, it's just a good mansion. <laughs> okay, I stole the plans off a couple of couple of other companies, Marksman and Jennings, and designed the designed it myself. Um, it's a it's a hump and big box, really, in terms of a home. Um, it's insulated within an inch of its life. There's three in the walls and three point five in the ceiling, sarking around all the walls, sarking in the ceiling. Excellent for keeping the dirt out as well. If you're OCD like me, it's fantastic going up and working in a roof cavity that doesn't have 25 years of gunge in it. Um, the solar system covers all of this um, one, one surface. It's eight and a half kilowatt, three phase, connected to a 10 kilowatt inverter. Um, and that's because that was as much as I could fit on that north facing 
roof area of the home. If I could have fitted 10 or 12, then that's how big the system would be, but eight covered it. Um, the main switchboard is as full as the full thing after it's eaten a lot. Um, and I could in no way run my all electric home off that one main switchboard. Wouldn't have too much going on. So what we see there, for those that are really interested, you've got your incoming service users. They, uh, that's where the mains come in. There's the meters, one off peak, one, um, one smart meter, as they're called. They're not smart. They're really dumb. They're just an integral meter. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, PowerPoint, so that I've got PowerPoint outside. Um, the main switchboards, the switch block that you see there, or circuit breaker board that you see there, it runs what I call the big stuff. It's got the air conditioners, the hot water system, all of that sort of thing running off it, as well as the garage where I you know, do welding and all sorts of things because engineered. Um, and then I'll come back to the little thing in the top right in a moment. And then the other three-phase circuit breaker, this one in from the orange ones, is the key to success if you're electrifying your homes. And this is where we really go down the rabbit hole, Alice, in terms of electrification geekery or whatever. Submains are your friend. It is perfectly legal. It is actually a commercial standard in general for wiring, but under AS3000, the Australian wiring rules, it's perfectly legal to do this. You can run what's called a submain. And so what I have is a hundred big 16 square mil cable that runs from there, which is where that is, or oh, actually there, to there in my house. And that's where this is. This is a commercial grade circuit breaker sub main board. And from it run the totally ridiculous and overkill number of power points and light circuits that I have in the home, as well as all the main kitchen appliances and all of that sort of thing. And again, that was kind of done for other safety reasons because I used to work in Sydney and live down here and I knew that my wife and kids would be alone at night when I was traveling back and that sorts of thing. And so if, for instance, the circuit breaker trips, she doesn't have to go outside. All you have to do is go up into the wardrobe and open that and click and do, reset the circuit breaker, lights are back on, everybody's happy, bottles can be heated, whatever. Um, but the point is, if you're looking at electrifying a home and having a, a you know a, a lot of appliances hanging off it, this whole concept of a submain is the key to success in many ways because it allows you to have more than one switchboard. It means you don't get limited by this real estate issue in your main board. You punch out somewhere else, put it in your pantry, put it somewhere else, run your kitchen and all of those sorts of other appliances and your power and lights off the subboard, and you, you can do it. You can do it quite easily. Um, the thing in the top right is a new thing. It's an Australian-made appliance. I'm not going to advertise for it because it's working, but we'll see how long it works for. It's called the Catch Power. Um, it's a solid-state piece of, of magical box. I'd love to know what's inside it. I think I've worked it out, but I can't say for certain. Um, it's a solid divert. And what it does is it diverts. It, it uses, I, I think it uses, does it by voltage control, actually. I don't think it actually diverts current. But um, it measures the output on one phase of the solar and diverts power from that phase into my hot water system when the solar is running during the day up to the point where it, it basically stops import and export from occurring. So it basically uses my hot water tank as a thermal battery in the home. And when the sun's shining, it'll give me a tank of hot water during the day and when the sun's not shining, then it flips over and it, it gets its usual old peak boost at night where you pay the discounted rate for electricity. Um, it's working well at the moment, I have to say. I'm quite impressed by it. Australian made. Um, but I'm not quite sure how long it's going to last. And when my current storage hot water system dies and I put a heat pump in, I guarantee it's not going to light the heat pump in it. are not going to be friends. So I'm going to have to do something else when that happens. Here endeth everything. Thank you for the question. Let's discuss. Thank you. He's out of the gates. Thank you. Is yes. 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 And then switch it back to hand. Because what is your investor going to do anything? No, 
one. The inverter will only do that. You mean the inverter for their solar system? Yeah. yeah, the inverter for the solar system just converts AC to DC and spits it out. Um, I, I actually, the reason why I bought that is I actually piloted. I, I did a, I did a clunky engineering version of it myself, where I just put a timer and a changeover switch so that I could put the hot water onto daytime use, and the timer was so that it would only operate when. The um when the sun was shining, like I said, you know, sort of you know nine till nine till two thirty ish sort of thing. But the problem with that is the hot water system will try and draw four point eight kilowatts because that's the size of the element, and the single phase output of my um, solar system is at best in one phase is only about two point eight kilowatts. So it meant that I was still drawing. A full freight power in from the grid to heat my hot water, and some of it was solar. The beauty of this device is it actually um, isolates the hot water tank in some ways from the main supply and only allows the solar behind the meter to go into the water tank. It means it takes longer to heat the water tank than if it was, and this is why I think it, it uses voltage management because I'm going to, sorry everyone, this is. I'll, I'll, I might have to stop in a second, but because their water tanks are resistant low, you can vary how much power it uses by varying the voltage. So it's not a constant power situation because it's a resistant load. So what I'm pretty sure that it does is it winds down the voltage so that it just diverts the power behind the meter. And it means that the tank takes longer to heat, but I don't worry about that because it's still all free energy from, from the solar. So Sorry, I need to get uh, less volatile feedback and just connect it directly. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. So exactly yes, or a 15 kilowatt solar system yeah. where one one phase would, would have enough oomph to heat the water heater. Absolutely, but I haven't got the roof for that. So, so what phase appliance called? Cat power. Sorry? Cat power. Cat power. Yeah, cat power will come up. Because it's going directly, so there's going to be no. So far, seems to all work fine. It's a bit of a, even as electric engineer, that's why I say it annoys me a little bit because it's kind of a little magic box that I want to pull apart. But I think I think it might never be the same if I do that. So you've got a 4.8 kilowatt element. Yep. That's how some magic can a person can start to run at a lower. Yes, it runs at a lower power because, as I said, because an element is just a resistor. You can vary the amount of power that it's consuming by winding down the voltage. It, it doesn't draw a constant current; it's just a constant resistance. And it's not it, it will use extra capacitor, but it's not sort of on or off. It's yeah, it varies. Yeah, yeah, it's real. It's funky ass. Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that the reason why you have trouble with the heat pump because that's a set? Yeah, correct. 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 Set yes, yeah. but the good news is the heat pump to get the same hot water out of it would only be a one point five kilowatt system at best, so one point two. So Kind of be happy to just have a dumb switch and flip it over because it's well within the single phase capacity of solar. Yeah. Sorry, getting out here. Like Sorry, you like that like I, I'm not going, um, because of the smart inverter technology on the air conditioners. I, I'm worried that there'd be some sort of weird competition between them. I really, from what I understand of how it works, and again. It, you can't find out how it works, and rightly so. It's their IP. Their company have invented this. They're not going to share it with everyone because otherwise you could replicate it. Um, but I, I really think it's only geared up to work with dumb resistive loads. Um, I don't think it would work with something clever like an inverter-based air conditioning system or the like. Sorry, Tam. That's two questions. Yeah. Sorry. If you had to rank this between a movable and economic and energy efficiency, Issue. What is it? What is the biggest issue? What's the biggest issue? Is it energy, economic, or political? As we're facing at the moment, it's political will to change the economics. I'm going to whip it up a bit too often. It's political will. Because the government, to solve energy markets and, and all the stuff that I'm talking about now, there are <laughs> basically three pathways, and it's a federal government issue. And there's three pathways that they can follow. The first one is realize that everything that's there is no longer fit for purpose and just wipe it and start again with a clean sheet of paper to do something else. 
Um, I think that would be, in the words of the, the, the old TV series, a courageous decision, Minister. Politically. <laughs> politically. Right, yeah? Because bear in mind, the thing you're doing here when you play around with these markets and when you wipe them out and start again is you are wiping out the revenue streams for multi-billion dollar companies that can afford multi-billion dollar lawsuits, um, many of whom, in terms of companies, I'm so old, I remember when the companies, the, the whole, they didn't even exist. The companies have been created for nothing. Literally, but they now exist and they make billions of dollars of profit, and that's got an economic impact, blah, blah, blah. So that's choice one. Choice two would be heavy handed intervention into the existing markets, which is, you know, a bit like, you know, chisel the corners off to fit the square peg through the round hole. Now, governments of um, the two major flavors, red and blue, um, I can't see ever having the will to do that. The blue team won't do it because they worship the god of markets, being all knowing. And the red team aren't going to do it because every time they do a heavy-handed marketing intervention, it's a free kick for the blue team politically to get the crap out of them. I'm trying to keep this apolitical in what I'm saying, but you can't not do that, okay? Um, so the third pathway is the only one that I think viable in terms of transformation. And the third pathway is what they need to do is lower the barriers to entry for new and innovative players into these markets. The only practical pathway uh, as an engineer who, who thinks that you know the whole study of economics was invented so that astrology would be credible <laughs> as an engineer i favor option one but i'm old enough to understand the politics and say the sensible thing is what they need to do is make it not so hard for a community cooperative to get a wholesale and a retail license to not have to hire 8,000 lawyers and wade through 900 pages of regulations and all of that. There should be ways to send it out or to, or to have new disruptive, not for profit or low profit or innovative players come into the electricity market and disrupt it that way. And that will then slowly erode the ability for the large incumbent players to dominate as they do in the energy markets. So, can you have that? Yeah. That's what it's trying to you know what it would actually cost to do a trading it for free to actually get back into the market. Like it's not for profit. If you were you know, it's like it's gonna uptake the old practically, even if you paid full freight to use the grid as it is at the moment, and I'm just talking the distribution grid here, my alma mater, you know, the um the stuff that's supplying us in the month. Rough numbers, and again, I'm no economist or accountant here, um, but rough enough, even if you paid current full freight to use the grid and generated the energy using solar, locally produced solar, a logical endpoint that you reach is that we could theoretically, in a community cooperative not for profit, giving a bit of money to run it and all of that, we could theoretically be paying between 15 and 18 cents a kilowatt hour for our electricity. As opposed to the 35 to 38 that we're paying. That's the numbers. And they're not even all my numbers. They're, they're Saul Griffith and his genius and, and Josh Ellison, who works for him and that sort of thing, who's got like spreadsheets that are getting on this. They're, they're their numbers as well as backed up with my own experience. Um, sorry, sir, you had in that for a while. In my notes. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. um, yeah. uh, the, are people going to be. Like the transmission costs, are they going to fall a higher burden on people that don't have much roof space and can't and stuff like oh. people out of the grid? You, you, oh, absolutely. The the biggest. I don't use the word tragedy. I don't like catastrophizing. But one of the saddest things about the energy um, transformation that's going on at the, uh, on at the moment is the social equity, or more accurately, the social inequity that it's engendering. The reality is the monopoly businesses are regulated to what's called a revenue cap. So they're inoculated against volumetric variance on the energy that flows through their network. Right, yeah? There's an under and over account. So they get a fixed amount of money per unit. Right, yeah? So if people use less energy, that's fine. They just charge more per unit for the energy that's going through. That's how the regulated monopolies work. Right, yeah? So now take that down to the individual consumer level. If you're somebody who is affluent enough to own a roof and affluent enough to put solar on that roof, you have massively reduced your own personal energy bill because you're self-consuming. That means 
that the amount of money to run the, the businesses is now recovered over a smaller base. And that smaller base is comprised more and more of people who don't own a roof and can't afford to put so and or can't afford to put solar on their roof. Renters, lower SES, et cetera, et cetera. So one of this is why I'm so such an advocate of small group thinking and localized community-based sharing of energy, because the other thing that it does is it is it starts to undo the energy imbalance, social energy imbalance that's occurring and the energy poverty that's that's occurring through our society at the moment between the haves and the have-nots. Great question. That's it. I'm now thinking very glad of what you said to say on the white community and we headed back towards the physics of what's available first. I have not common sense. Forget about the red and blue and all that first stuff, but you know, remodel what's here now and what, what can be, you know, the envelope growing yeah. too, and, and and also the notes, as it were. We have a pretty good picture of that. Say it takes two years to do that, for the sake of art. <clears throat> then you build on what all the other stuff that you've been talking about, you know, politics and the market and that sort of stuff. Because the reality is we need to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's just my thinking, you know, unfortunately, it's yeah, we're all we're all flawed. We're all on the spectrum. Well, we start there. We start there, and with the eventualities built into that model, also. And one of the things that you could throw in there, of course, is the you know, the innovation that should be on the table, as it were. All things are the yes. Okay, so I think. The, the challenge is, um, I don't think we've got the luxury of time. I'm, I'm not arguing with you. I don't think we have the luxury of time. And I think there's more emergency for action here. And, you know, what can we do? Let's electrify our homes. Let's storm the barricade. Let's try and um, uh, disrupt. I, I describe the electricity industry as it stands at the moment as looking and feeling much like the taxi industry did just before Uber arrived. Pam said that one before. Um, I actually think that a solution riffing off what you're saying here rather than just the modeling i actually think a solution where we get somebody who's prepared to go in there and instead of saying oh page one of the thousand pages of the national electricity rules what does this say i can and can't do yeah. but it does what uber did and basically walk in put a match to that warm themselves on the globe and go and do whatever the hell they want yeah. um and force the rules to change i actually feel like that's what what's needed if you're ever having a talk with your old boss, that's when you should be spending his money on. <laughs> Not pipe dreams of sending electricity yeah. on a cable. I did that earlier. That's what some cable is. Um, that's what people who could be big disruptors here probably should be spending their money on. What could happen, doing what you want to do, we haven't got the time. You could have this new stuff up. You yes. I mean? yeah. You know, say, well, you, you know, the excuse of expediency to do something is a work as opposed to sit back two hours of thinking is better than one hour of you know which is the which is the um the, the boogeyman on the stick that they emo wave all the time is the lights will go out and you know wave that in front of any politician and and you, okay. you get anyway. you get what you get you're the, I'm, I'm violently agreeing with you sir right. <laughs> um sorry okay yes well, I was just thinking, what are the solutions to even out the house and have some place? But you know what I mean? Like, mm. the rent is possible. We do have solar in the room. And most of us are working on that. We are not using yeah, no, energy is. during the day. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of people will just have the individual batteries in the hole. But that has a, most batteries are 10 year limits, so you have yep. to replace them. But how about even at a local council, local government area, where you have community batteries, community storage battery of all the roofs you do have solar in that suburb going into the grid, and then everyone, even with distributors in that area, can use it. And you're selling it. You're singing the song of my people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, so even though selling it because. When you sell it back to the grid, 
they you don't get a lot, but you Does pay it, more to use oh, it. I'll go one better. Oh, oh, let me <laughs> let, let me jump in. Okay. Now I need to declare self-interest if you want. Um, and so my gig with the university, because you've all got to have a side hustle. I actually work with an Australian company called EcoJewel. That's why I know the jewels, by the way. Um, uh, I'm actually a shareholder in the company. Um, and EcoJewel makes grid side of the meter technology that is specifically designed to help the grid work with distributed energy resources. One of the product lines that the company make are community batteries. Um, that's one there. That's actually an eco dual unit. I'm not wanting to use this as a promotion or anything for that. I'm just saying to riff off that. Yes, um, community batteries are one of the key enabling technologies to democratize access to locally generated clean energy because they move clean solar, free solar, outside from behind the meter and into the shared part of the energy grid. And by doing that, they open up access for low-income earners, renters, people who can't afford a roof, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the business models for that are, 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 are very strange because an individual battery, I should have left it up, shouldn't I? An individual battery is, can't store enough energy to make a solid business case in and of itself, right? You, you're doing your money to install one community battery, okay? But if you install 200 community batteries all working in concert, or 100 of them in a, in a, across a couple of suburbs all working in concert, the business case for it's so compelling you'd want to put your superannuation in. It's this flip over. But the reason why community batteries aren't taking off in Australia is because of our market structure. And our market structure says that left of the line is a market and right of the line is a monopoly. And monopoly businesses can't operate in the market and market businesses can't do any function for the monopoly function. What are these? This is retailing energy and selling energy is the market and the monopoly is the grid, the grid side of, of things. Right, Ian? The money that you can make and the, how you monetize and can afford a community battery is 50% market and 50% monopoly. This is just a perfect example of how you've got a line drawn that separates these things in the regulation of the market at the moment, and you've got a technology that sits exactly evenly on either side of that line. So what we're seeing in Australia is the regulators trying to force the battery ownership into one side or other of that, mainly towards the, the retail side of things. And sorry? And the monopoly businesses, my alma mater, Endeavour Energy, Osgrid, and all of them, they're going, no, 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 we'll own the batteries, we'll own the batteries. But in doing that, they can only justify half the number of batteries and half the size because they can only make half the income because they can only make a return on the grid support functions that it offers. They can't make a return on trading the energy. That's where we need a disruptor. We need a community group to come in and own the fleet of these batteries and do both functions. And the thing preventing them from doing that is the thousand lawyers they need to hire to get all the licenses to be able to do it. Sorry? That's the perfect, it's the perfect spot for it. Absolutely. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. That community batteries are a key to unlocking and democratizing all of this. Um, they solve so many of the problems, including soaking up solar when there's too much of it right in the street and being able to discharge it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 
well, it doesn't at the moment. Um, and you know, there and therein lies the problem. And again, so you know, what you what what you're doing there, said with affection and love, is trying to again bring together the physics and the market. <laughs> and there's a the problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the reality is what's happening at the moment is these batteries are being used um, by the network companies for grid support reasons. And that means that none of the market facing challenges are actually occurring. I mean, I, I'd like to see, if you ask me as a, as a solar sort of person, um, I'd rather not own my own home battery and have to manage it and all of that sort of assets. I'd rather rent a storage unit. I'd rather rent some of the capacity in a battery in the street and be able to store so many kilowatt hours of my exported energy there and then use it back again once the sun's gone down. Because at the moment, I get five cents for exporting it, okay, and then I buy it back in the evening. I'll round the numbers to make it easier. It's thirty-five cents. It's actually thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. So I've got a net position of thirty cents. Okay. Ask me if I would rather pay fifteen cents to rent it to to, to store those kilowatt hours in the in there and then get them back for free once the sun's gone down. I'll grab that. that. That's a bargain. I'll just halve my energy costs. Well, it's cost me 15 and not 30. So the business models for this exist. All we need is somebody to come in, count the books, you pick them up, I'm looking at, looking at that. Someone to come in and disrupt it with this sort of model. Don't expect the retailers and the network companies to do this because if they had a way to do it, then they'd already be doing it. They're not, they're not done. They've got a lot of, a lot of people in there. Sorry, sir. Is there an argument for rewiring? Mm -hmm. I got a lot of money. I come in and I want to rewire. Physically, you mean? Pardon? Physically rewire. Everybody got rewired. And then, then do those things that you want to do and use the other wiring as we need it. There's a reason why there's a reason why the grid is um, a monopoly and regulated as such. Okay, um, it's um that's an Uber it's very expensive. Well, it's an engineering solution. I actually think that the, the Uber solution um, fails as an analogy in this point because I, I don't see that there's a physical infrastructure change that needs to occur here. Okay. It's a regulation change. The wires are there to do all this. I'm sorry, I don't know where the they're coming from. Uh, can I propose like, a possibility? I feel like there's been a huge missed opportunity for these new residential developments out there. Do you think? They yeah. Put everything out. They could have had this change. They could have that community that's yep. not connected to the rest of the grid and that could be a pilot project. Yep. See how it works. Worst case scenario, okay, they need energy from somewhere else. They can just connect this one and this one and back yep. on the grid. So. Absolutely. And show you here's it. Is anyone here a land developer or related to another land developer? I know I'm asking this genuinely before I say the land down. So. Is anyone here? A, okay, right here. I spent a quarter of a century dealing with developers on, on all of this, okay? If you look at all the rules and regulations that a developer needs to follow and all the costs associated with it, and the big move model, it's a way to lose money. The only way as a developer you make money is by cutting corners and getting away with not doing as much of the things you should be doing as you can. That's the only way the business model is profitable. There's so much regulation surrounding development. Now, it sounds like I'm defending them there, doesn't it? Here's the phrase that I usually open with. You show me a developer who's not a crook, and I'll show you a developer that you don't know well enough. <laughs> okay? That's, that's the corollary to that. So I'm not anti what you're saying. I, I fully agree with it, but it needs to change, not from the development industry, it needs to change from a, a legislative piece from a local council or someone like that. Yeah. To or mandate that to occur, and then there. it will happen. Or a government owned developer. Or government owned developer, like Landform used to be. Yes. Asking a crook to do something last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me know how that goes. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so that's the same thing. Who's next? Sorry, right. sorry yes, yeah. sorry. To your knowledge, is there any change of money at the I've heard in the last couple of months that there's a couple of community batteries on the boat, one from like Zappo and one from the other one? Do you know anything? Not a lot about them. Um, <laughs> I wasn't smart enough to, to call it a career that I actually um, designed um, device from, oh, that seems like a good idea, worked out how to do it with my engineering team, 
installed and commissioned the first what we would now call community battery in New South Wales. Um, it was done, how long, I've been out of endeavour three and a half years. So to be getting almost five years ago, it's actually located on the road out to Wonga Wooly, the West Africa. Yes, yeah, that's it. Um, 11 kV, one megawatt, two megawatt hour battery. Decent size and that sort of thing. Um, there is a federal program to install community batteries across the nation that's active at the moment. Um, the first places we're going to see them here locally are Warawong and Dapto. Um, we'll see more. There's one going in in Kiama as well um, that we've never installing. There's several going in up in the um, Southern Highlands and quite a large project also going on um, down at Borley Point, Kiola, down on the far south coast, which is a, a fascinating project that coordinates quite a large community battery with uh, coordinating and how it works with behind the meter batteries locally and running as a microgrid. Um, the reason for that project is because the Borley Point, Kiola area has an electrical demand of X for 48 weeks of the year, and then for four weeks of the year, it's four times that. And the economics of investing traditional poles and wires infrastructure for just four weeks in the year don't stack up. And so they're doing something different to, to try and um, innovate in how they supply electricity in that area. The other thing is the area was, was very severely affected by the bushfires of 2020. And there's a significant energy resilience play in community storage and community energy batteries. Once you go out to what I would call fringe grid, for more remote communities. I think there's another element there. And, you know, if we go down to the South Coast, we see more and more of this, where there's a huge opportunity for energy resilience going into the discussion as well. I wish I had more answers. I wish I had a rosier picture. The tech, the, the rosy picture is, the tech's there. This shit's been done. I built it five years ago. It works. I know it works. Right here. The challenge is getting the right sort of financing behind it and getting the right disruption behind it to move the needle on mass rather than one here, one there, one over there. Yes, sir. So yeah, it's hard for me to get into almost yeah, we'll, we'll let you go soon. Let's go on the community back because you asked questions about it. It was almost that. Yeah. Who should own the community back? Ah, because the community the, the thing is they don't call them community batteries, but they're actually owned by the likes of the and it's <clears throat> or whoever that is putting it in. Um and is there's power and money there and it's gonna be hard for community organizations to own the infrastructure. Yeah. Um here's here, here, what are your vision? What's your vision what, my, sort of, like, my vision. Vision. Okay, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first of all, first of all, since I've I've something to boot in a lot of organizations that aren't here to defend themselves. So I'll continue that thing <laughs> Um Osred recently announced um as you said I was in the AFR. I'll leave you to work out <laughs> the agenda there. Um we found a sweet spot. We found a sweet spot they announced. We're going to put community batteries in our zone substations. Does anyone know what a zone substation is? I, I, I love zone substations. I've built hundreds of them. People hate them. Nobody likes living near them. They are a necessity for our reliable electricity supply. Okay. Um, so they said they're going to put them in the zone substations, which by definition means they've been connected to what's called the medium voltage network or the 11,000 volt part of the grid. Um, Pulling those a community battery when they're connected into a zone substation. The generous way to describe that is sophistry. The accurate way to describe it is it's a lie. Because they are not community batteries. They're not in the community for F sake. They're in the grid. The grid support batteries. So one of the big things that needs to happen here is control of that narrative to start. That's the old man yells at clouds part of this answer. Now we'll do the now we'll do the actual practical answer to the question. Um, I actually think that there's a there's a model and a business model in there for what I, I, I call a CBO, a community battery operator. Um, and the, the tragedy of this is we, we were getting to this up until last year. Um, and last year, not the, the general, you know, the national electricity market showed how flawed it is and it had to be suspended when the prices went too lowly tap. Um, and it was suspended for nearly two months. The consequence of that suspension was it drove to the wall and drove out of business much of the mid to small tier innovators and retailers that are out there in the market. We just left the cartels largely in charge. Now we're seeing more 
of them starting to come back online, but it took years to actually build what was there, and then it got wiped out in a couple in a week, literally. So the I have a dream answer to your question, and then we can wrap up if you like, is I think what we need is some innovative retailers to work to come in, work as a disruptor, work to a low profit or profit sharing or not for profit mindset, establish themselves as the CBO, the community battery operator, as well as the um, retailer of the within the community that buys and sells and trades and keeps the money from that energy circulating and the savings circulating within that community. That's a model that I think offers the greatest opportunity for us. Um, and then once there's enough of them there as a fleet, they then contract the network support functions back to the monopoly businesses and it becomes, and that's how they monetize that, that part of it. That's the model that I see practically works. Is it perfect? Oh, hell's no. But does it swing with the rip that we're in? Yes. Well, right. Is that being a midnight no, notice? No. Yeah. That um those batteries show the little photos of the battery now on the sitting on the side of the road. How many thousands does that supply? That one. Uh, that, that loaded question. It's a 95 kilowatt hour battery. So that's you know maybe a dozen, depending on diversity. So it's it would it's the equivalent of a dozen homes having their own battery. Yeah, one of the, I, I won't unpack it too much in difference of time, but one of the great benefits of as soon as you jump onto the grid side of the of the energy supply system is you can leverage what's called diversity, which is not everybody uses electricity to exactly the same pattern or whatever, and so most people sort of would care or know, but. Once you get 20 people connected to a low voltage circuit, you can actually connect 40 of them and not have to upgrade it because of the diversity of how they all use their use their power. And it's, it works the same way for batteries. So there's, what's the equivalent to how many, you could probably connect 40 or 50 homes and, and still be within the capacity of uh, practically of using that battery because of the diversity that's out there. So perhaps we have one more. Uh, one more question. One more. Yes. Give us two because we're standing next to each other. It's a two for one there. <laughs> how could I say? How could I say that? Yeah. Um, you know you're from the East Coast. Um, that the percentage of university is five hundred kilowatt hour battery based on ten cars. Yes. Silver buckshot. Yes. Fantastic. Should be more of it. Um, at the moment, Vita G, I think, I was really talking about that earlier, wasn't it? Yeah, Vita G or Vita H, sorry, vehicle to home is probably the more practical thing. Um, and at the moment, I think it's only a Gen 2 LEAF, which uses the old, I can never remember the acronym yeah. for it, which had no plug, that's right. Um, and yeah, and the Mitsubishi plug in ones, yeah. Um, and there's talk that the latest BYD Dolphin. We'll have V to G. Sorry, but the, the biggest challenge, if anyone's looking at that as well, is getting buying buying two way charges. These aren't my words. Um, Solar quote says it best when he says two way two way vehicle charges are as scarce as rocking horse poo, um, and they are horrendously expensive. They're about ten times the cost of a of a good one way home charger. Um, so vehicle to grid, I think, is coming but it's still a while away. And I think um, in particular, watch this. My prediction on vehicle to grid is, um, I read just recently that um, Tesla have applied for a retailer license in Australia for a VPP. Watch this space. When they've got the vehicles, it'll be a firmware upgrade over the air to the vehicles. And if you've got the Tesla power wall, and or the car and or the charger or whatever, they'll find a way to put the ticket on all of that and away they go. So my prediction on V to G is probably watch Tesla because they've just got a retailer license and they're smarter than I'll ever be. So if I've worked it out, they sure as they'll have. <laughs> That's right.
I've just got seven questions. <laughs> <laughs> now, one, we've, we've talked about small scale a lot of stuff, but I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on the resins. I was really excited for them, and now it looks like it's going to be five new uh, renewable energy zones because of the transmission story around that. Do you think they're a mistake or just too far out? No, they're absolutely not a mistake. They're absolutely the right priority. They're absolutely the right idea. Of um, they are the fact that the resins had to occur is a is an F a fail on the report card of the planning instruments around the national electricity grid, right? Yeah, because basically what the resins are is the state government in New South Wales that king at the time with full due credit saying, you know what, that's not going to give the people of New South Wales what they need in terms of primary infrastructure to connect big scale renewables into the grid to replace coal as it ages out. We need to accelerate that. Hence the res, the res concept was created. And what the reses are really about is building a piece of shared trunk infrastructure funded in part by the government and recovered then as entities will connect their wind and solar farms to it. So the reses are absolutely needed, right here. Small grid will probably reduce the volumetrically how much is needed of activity and construction within the residence, absolutely. But we need we need all of it, we need both. Why are the residents not progressing? The residents are not progressing because we as a species um, don't like infrastructure near us or where we can see it. I spent 35 years designing and building electricity lines and electricity substations. I can tell you here and now, before I have any conversation with any community group, and trust me, I've had billions of them, um, where the best spot for the new electricity infrastructure is. It's a way over there on land I don't own and where I can't see. <laughs> and that's not being harsh towards the people of suburb X or whatever, whatever. That's not how we all think. We're hearing it now about offshore wind as well. But the bottom line is, in my view, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. And the needs of the many outweigh the wants of the few. And the reality is we, the majority of people in New South Wales at the moment are being disadvantaged in terms of progress on decarbonisation and clean energy by a minority of people who are opposing these transmission lines going in. And the people who are opposing it will feel very differently, <laughs> I'm sure. I know I've spoken to whole halls of community people that were a lot less friendly than this room. And I tell you that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but that is human nature. And so the real thing that needs to happen with the resins is a bit of um, fortitude to doze them through, physically and politically. Um, because the alternative is we keep burning coal and gas. This has been a really great meetup. I hope you've all gotten something out of it. I know I certainly have. Um, I want to say thank you to Tim for coming along and sharing his colour and his great. Um, I want to thank my wife, Rin, who made the introduction to Ty. So thank you so much, Rin. And of course, to Ty, thank you, mate, for coming in and sharing all of your wisdom. And I saw you sit down at the end now. It's like, yeah, we've done. We've gotten to the end. Sit down. Um, if you have any other topics that you'd love to learn about, please message me. Um, I'm available at dave at easyagile.com. Um, if you have anyone in the industry who you would love to introduce to me so we can have another presentation on some other topic in the net zero space, please let me know. Um, until then, see you next time. Thanks for coming. Thank mm -hmm. you.